Good morning and welcome to Connect Church Online. I'm going to jump straight into it this morning. Parents, if you want to have more meaningful, faith-filled conversations with your kids but aren't sure where to begin, we've got you covered. Head to connectcalgary.ca, click on Kids, and there you'll find age-appropriate, engaging Bible lessons and activities that you can do together as a family. It's a fun and easy way to teach your kids about the God that created them and Jesus who loves them. For the past few months, you guys have been anxiously awaiting the day when we can be back together in person. Well, that wait is finally over. Go ahead and mark it on your calendar. Mother's Day, Sunday, May 9th, is Relaunch Sunday. More details are yet to come, but plan on joining us May 9th as we regather in person to worship together. We're so excited and we can't wait to see you all again face to face. We also want to give a special shout out and much deserved thank you to members of our dream team who came to the church over the past few days to paint, fix, and prepare this space. We could not do it without you and we are so incredibly grateful for your time and efforts invested in our church. If you're already a member of the dream team, watch for an email over the next couple weeks about scheduling for services in May. And if you're not already on the dream team, there's room for you to join us. Whatever it is that you're gifted in, and yes, you're gifted at something, we need people like you in order to make services possible. To join the dream team and make a difference in our city, go to connectcalgary.ca slash team. Now let's go to pastors Dan and Amber for another installment of our message series from the book of James. All right, Amber, let me kick off with a question for you. What is the biggest crime you have ever committed that you're willing to admit on camera? The biggest crime you've ever committed that you are willing to tell the internet? Um, not wearing a mask when I'm supposed to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair no. enough. No, that's fair enough. Know. That's the biggest crime. I think there's probably some other stuff. Speeding. But that's okay. Speeding. I, I was going 85 miles an hour um, yesterday when that's that's like... I don't know what that converts to. It was like 130. Yeah, that's about right. 130 kilometers an hour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Speeding is probably the smallest crime that I've ever committed. Oh, well, how about you? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like many kids when I was younger, I shoplifted. I stole stuff from stores that I shouldn't have. And, you know, I've said before that I dallied in a little bit of illegal drugs and things like that. So, like, you know, I mean, I think uh, there are probably a few different answers I could give there. Wow. I'm such a good church girl compared yeah. to... <laughs> Today's we continue the book of James. We're actually going to we're going to look at something he says in which he points out a sin that we're all really guilty of. And it might seem relatively minor, but he's going to argue that if you persist in this sin, you shouldn't even call yourself a Christian which is incredibly strong language, right? Like that is a very serious thing to say. If you commit this sin, you might fundamentally misunderstand what it even means to be a Christian. So if you are a believer, you're going to want to stay tuned in today because you want to make sure that you have not or are not committing this sin. But if you are not a follower of Jesus, I think if you stick around with us, you're going to learn something about the Christian faith that perhaps you didn't know previously. It might make you more intrigued or, you know, it might invite you to take a step closer even to faith in Jesus yourself. So why don't we go ahead and read James chapter number two, verse one. We're just going to read verse one for now. Let's read it for the folks. Yeah, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you have favor, if you favor some people over others? Mm, there we go. Okay, so James starts off here by saying, my dear brothers and sisters, okay? He is using this term of affection and endearment because honestly, he is about to drop the hammer on these people. And by extension, he's going to drop the hammer on me and you too, okay? He is really going to confront us about this hidden kind of overlooked sin that we think is no, no big deal really, all right? So he starts off by really communicating to these people, what I'm about to say, I say because I love you. 
I really want you guys to know my care for you, my desire for unity in the church and wholeness in the world, this is what is driving what I am about to say to you. Okay, the people who read this letter originally, they're going to need that reminder. And honestly, by the time we get done this morning, you might be glad that James gives this reminder as well. My dear brothers and sisters, I love you guys. We're all family, and I want the best for us. That's why I'm about to say what I'm about to say. He says then, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if, okay? Now, before we get to the if part, let me just point out here. He is literally saying that this issue is so serious, it's so significant, that if you misunderstand it, you may misunderstand what it means to be a Christian. This is fundamental to understanding the gospel, to understanding the character and nature of God, and what it means for you to be saved in the world today. This is huge, what he's about to say, and and you cannot miss this, okay? He says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if you favor some people over others? Wow. No, wait a sec, wait a sec here, okay? Uh, James is super worked up over favoritism. Right. I don't know. Like, I would have expected him to say, like, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if you worship false gods? Or, I mean, didn't (laughs) Jesus have a favorite disciple? Ah, we're going to get there. Okay, so you're already ahead of me on this one, okay? Um, You know, you might have expected him to say, like, how can you claim to have faith in the Lord Jesus if you you know, steal money from the church offering plate or something like that. Um, Like if you give up on church, you would expect him to list something really huge, something really dramatic. And yet instead he says, if you favor, show favoritism to one group of people over another, then you don't even understand the gospel. You probably shouldn't even call yourself a Christian until you get this sorted out. Like that's very surprising, isn't it? I know it should be surprising to those of you guys who are watching at home. See, James addresses something that is really common in our world, but it shouldn't happen at all in the church. It should have no place in the kingdom of God whatsoever. See, the the problem is that the first century church was starting to act like the world in this regard, okay? And, And what I'm afraid of is that those of us who are Christians in the 21st century, we're prone to do the same thing to make the same mistake, to show favoritism to people based on superficial qualities and characteristics that we really shouldn't, okay? So when James talks about favoritism here, what exactly does that mean? How do I know if I'm committing the sin of of favoritism? And more importantly, what is James not saying here, Mm -hmm. okay? This goes to what you said a moment ago, that James is not saying you cannot like certain individuals more than you like other individuals. You can't have your favorite people on the planet, okay? We know that's not what he's saying for several different reasons. One is, it just makes logical sense. Of course, I'm going to favor my family over strangers. Right, I'm your favorite person on the planet. 100%. Yes. Okay, and you're going to favor your husband over some random guy at the grocery store. Yes, No I matter how so. tall and stacked that guy is, right? Like, you're going to favor... You're my favorite. Yeah, thank you. You're going to favor certain people, certain individuals, and that's not a bad thing, okay? James is not saying that you cannot like, you know, certain people more than others or that you have to like everyone the exact same amount. That literally doesn't make sense. It's not even possible, okay? And then, as you mentioned, if he were saying that you have to love every individual the exact same amount, well, then Jesus would be guilty of breaking this scripture. Absolutely. Because, you know, the Bible tells us a lot of people don't even know this. Jesus had many, many followers. He had a group of 72. You're like, I don't ever hear about 72 apostles. No, because out of the 72, he had 12 that he favored. Mm -hmm. And then out of the 12, he had three that he favored. And, you know, there were some that claimed to be his favorite. There was a little bit of discussion among the group about that. So even Jesus favored some individual people more than others. That's not what James is saying here. Of course you can have your favorite people, your best friends that you're close to. I mean, like just in practicality, you can't think of your friend that you have been building a relationship with to an acquaintance to a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. They're not on the same level. You're going to have favoritism to someone that you know more. Mm -hmm. So what is James saying here? When he says that favoritism is anti-Christian, it is counter to the gospel, 
What does he mean? Well, he actually clarifies for us in verses 2 through 4. So let's read that, and we'll get a better sense of what he means here. It says, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discriminate discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives. Okay, so James, he starts out here by talking about this this group of Christians in the churches that he's writing to, and they're showing favoritism to rich people, and they are basically putting down poor people. Now, you could approach this from the slightly wrong angle, and you could think, oh, James is saying, like, you know, you shouldn't favor rich people, and you shouldn't, you know, put down poor people. That is what he's saying, but he's saying a lot more than that. See, the key to understanding this section of verses that you just read is the first two words words there in verse number two. The first two words are, for example, Mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So he's going to give you one example of the much broader point that he's making. He could have inserted several different examples here. So he's not only talking about wealth, he's actually talking about something much, much bigger. And I I think another important word that's in this passage of scripture is discrimination. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be poor or rich. It can be ethnicities. It can be um, hair color. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know what I mean? Like totally. That, yeah. It can all play a part. Well, so what we see here, okay, is that they are giving special attention to certain people who are dressed in fancy clothes and they're wearing expensive jewelry. And of course, they're taking advantage of or they're overlooking people who come in dressed in rags. And it's very clear that they don't have a lot of power or money or status in life. So here's the deal, okay? These people that James is addressing, they are showing favoritism based on superficial characteristics. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. Problem. They are judging an entire group of people and showing favor to those who fall on this side of the group and then disfavor or dishonor to the people that fall on that side of the group, okay? The word that we would use today is that they are guilty of prejudice. Yes. They're prejudiced Christians. And James says that is is anti-Christ. Yes. That you should not even call yourself a Christian if you harbor that kind of prejudice against different groups of people, okay? I mean, let's be real for a moment. This is the way our world works. Our world is based on division. It's based on judgment. It's even based on prejudice. That's just the way things have always worked. Rich people get special opportunities compared to poor people, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Good-looking people get treated better than average-looking people, don't they? If you dress well, you tend to get better treatment. I was watching this documentary one time, and it was called, like, Beautiful Girl or something like that. And uh, this girl shows up at a very fancy store, and she goes to do all of her shopping, but she's not dressed very nicely. And so they refuse to help her. Is this Pretty Woman? Oh, okay. I thought that was a documentary. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? You dress in a certain way and you will get like positive attention and you may get you know negative attention if you are dressed like in a poor fashion in a way that you know says oh i'm not very fancy or sophisticated or whatever the case may be right Right, and this is a bad habit that starts at a young age i can you know i used to be a preschool teacher a long long time ago and i i can see that even happening in preschoolers where kids are choosing other kids because of the toys that they came with yeah, or right? <laughs> because you know of of what they look like or whatever mm-hmm. even friendliness and personality which of course you're attracted to certain types of personalities but again if you're favoring certain people because they're extroverted and these people are introverted, mm-hmm. so I'm not going to favor them. Mm-hmm. That's also prejudice. Well, hey, let me let me get you really riled up here, <laughs> okay. okay? We live in a world in which systematically men make more money than women do mm-hmm. for the same job, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Okay. I, I could talk we, an hour about uh, this. I know you but. could. We live in a world in which older people often get overlooked in favor of younger people, don't we? Mm-hmm. 
Like that's just the way that the world we lives in that we live in works, right? Disabled people often get ignored by like the majority side of culture. Let's just pretend that there are people that don't have intellectual or physical disabilities or whatever the case may be. We marginalize people who are single. Oh man, in the church right. we do this all the time, right? Like if you're married, then you finally hit the status. But if you're still single and you're 38, like come on, what's wrong with you? Sort of thing. Right. And, and like for real now, okay. Um, the hashtag stop Asian hate has been trending on Twitter for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Why? Because we live in a world in which people are categorized and judged. They are favored or they are dishonored based on really superficial characteristics. We constantly judge people in this group as being better than that group, okay? James says this has no place in the church of Jesus. Right. That that should never happen in your heart and mind if you are a Christian. He says, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus if you have prejudice in your heart? If you show favoritism to one group of people over another based on these superficial characteristics. Mm -hmm. He says this is contrary to what it even means to be a Christian. Now, why is it so contrary? Why is it that favoritism, which seems like such a minor thing, right? Like, okay, so I'm a little bit nicer to people that are good looking or something like that. Why is that so contrary to my faith? What, do you want to answer? Go ahead. Yeah, I've got some ideas, but I want to hear from you too. Well, no, I, I think that God... He's created all of us indiv individually, mm -hmm. uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully uh, made. So good. Yeah. And and we're all different. Mm -hmm. And for someone, especially in leadership, like if we were prejudiced against someone walking through their church doors and and they feel that, mm -hmm. that's painful. Yeah. That's hurtful. And and you might not even realize it. You're doing this in your workplace or at school or whatever. And it hurts. Mm -hmm. That you might not ever hear that from the person, but it's painful and it hurts. And it's a sin on our part when we do it. Yeah, so I'm glad you said that because that really is kind of the first thing that came to my mind. Why is it that this sort of prejudice or the flip side, you understand that prejudice is the negative side and favoritism is the positive side. These are two sides of the same coin. They're basically the same sin. One is you're being nice to somebody because of their age or skin color or their wealth or you know whatever the case may be. And the other is you're putting them down. You're over overlooking them, you're marginalizing them because they don't have qualities that you would say are positive. Why is it that that is contrary to our faith? Well, like you mentioned, the first thing is that Christians believe that every single person on the planet bears the image of God yes. equally. Every yes. single person. So if you go back to Genesis chapter number one, verse 26, we're told that God says, let us, it's the Trinity talking here, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all in heaven, there is no humanity. And God says, let us create human beings in our image. Mm -hmm. Notice that's a blanket statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. God does not say, let us create white people in our image. He doesn't say, I'm gonna create men in my image. He says, I'm going to create humanity, right? He doesn't say, I'm going to create the able-bodied or the wealthy in my image. Those who were born to noble families, those are created in my image. And, you know, kids from the trailer park in Texas like you, Dan, well, I'm not so sure about you. No, God says, we are going to create humanity in my image image. This right? is a world struggle. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, because, you know, we don't have world peace and, and we're not going, we're not going there with this, but, <laughs> um, you know, even when a country is battling another country, there's always hate mm. towards that yeah. race, yeah, towards totally. that country. And those people, mm -hmm. those people are still it made in the image of God. And well, we're I mean, supposed to love them as people. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. You do see this. I wasn't really planning on getting into this, but you see this in war where, like, one side will dehumanize the other. Yes. So they'll call the other side cockroaches or, you know, even, like, epithets that I wouldn't dare say online, right? Like, or in my own head for that matter, guys. Uh, <laughs> let's just make that clear. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, we would use labels that dehumanize other people. But as a Christian, we believe that every single person on the planet is equally made in in God's image. And that means that they carry equal worth and dignity to everybody else that's on the planet. Listen to me, okay? The U.S. government can and has said that black people are only three-fifths of a person. Wow. God says, no, 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 no. Wow. That's not true. Okay? Our culture can tell us today that pre-born children don't have any right to life 
wow. until they exit the womb. Wow. God says, no, 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 no. They're human. They bear my image already. Social media promotes the idea that a woman is only as valuable as her body type mm. or shape, right? Mm -hmm. God says, no, you are an image bearer, no matter your race, no matter your age, no matter your economic situation, no matter what country it was that you happen to be born in, no matter your ability or disability, your gender, whatever it is, every single person on the planet is created in God's image. And so although our world has these sorts of thoughts, we as Christians, we've got to call these out mm -hmm. as wicked yes. and evil thoughts. Yes. And as Christians, we've got to guard ourselves so that we never ever view people through this dehumanizing lens that says, oh, this group of people is better than that group of people. Yes, it's racism, but my goodness, it is so much more than that. Anytime we judge people as better or worse based on these sorts of superficial characteristics, James says we have committed a grave sin. Let, let me make it really current and real. Like what about being prejudiced or showing favoritism to someone who thinks like you during the COVID situation. Yeah. Well. Like they're non-maskers and I'm a non-masker. So I'm going to favor these people. And I'm really going to show some hate to these <laughs> people who are just pushing these restrictions and are constantly about more restrictions. We are all made in the image of God. Yeah. And we are all, even though we're yeah. not on the same page about every single thing, we still are called to love each other. Love your neighbor yeah. as yourself. Even the ones you disagree with. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this segues actually quite well into the next point. So Christians believe that every single person is created in the image of God equally, right? We're all image bearers. But also Christians believe that every single person is in equal need of a savior. Okay, in equal need of a savior. So in our world, you know, it's easy to believe that there are good people and there are bad people. There are those who have their lives together and those whose lives are a hot mess. We've got those who are on the right side of politics and those who are on the wrong side of politics. Like we can even use religious words and we can say, well, there are righteous people in the world. And then there are those who are sinful and all those different things. And, you know, it, we, it's very easy to say, okay, this group of people is correct. And this group of people is right and good, and I'm with them, I'm for them. This group of people over here, I can't stand them, I hate them. That's when you see the vitriol online, where it's like, you guys are horrible idiots, and you know everything that's wrong in the country or our world is because of you, this, you types of people, whatever that might be in the particular right. conversation, right? All of that. But as Christians, we don't believe that any group is better than the other. No group is worse, no group is better. We are all sinful people that are in need of a savior. Every single one of us. See, like our sins may be different, but we all have sins that need to be addressed. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter number seven, like don't, don't focus on the splinter in somebody else's eye when you have a giant log sticking out <laughs> of your eye, right? right? Okay, so every single person is equally created in God's image and every single person is equally flawed and sinful and in need of a savior, okay? So that's part of the reason that James says, listen, if you are a Christian, and you are prejudiced against somebody for some superficial characteristic, then you don't understand even what it means to be a Christian. But he goes on here in verse number five, and uh, he adds a couple of like, you know, a couple of other reasons or rationales, okay, for why this is a bad idea. Why don't you read that for yeah, us? Yeah, it says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? Mm. But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress? Uh, sorry. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus, whose noble name you bear? Okay. Yeah, so he gives two other reasons here why, like, as a Christian, in their situation, it's a bad idea to favor rich people. He gives a theological reason, and then he gives a much more practical reason, okay? So he essentially says, look, theologically speaking, God has said that, like, rich people have a hard time entering the kingdom of God because rich people tend to trust in their wealth. Now, again, God is not opposed to wealth. He's not opposed to rich people. He's opposed to rich people who believe their wealth will protect them right. in the end. It will not. He's not saying, hey, if you're rich, you're not coming to heaven. No. Like, what he's saying is he's saying. you have to let go of the 
the the faith or confidence that you have in your wealth. That's not where you get your identity. It's not where you get your safety, your stability, that sort of thing. Okay. So he makes this theological argument. He's like, why are you guys favoring a group of people that God has said have a really hard time understanding him and, and the ways of his kingdom, right? He makes this theological argument. But then he goes on and he makes a much more practical argument. And he says, listen, in our world today, Christians, and this, I'm not saying in 2021, this is necessarily going on, certainly not North America, okay? But in James's day, Christians were being actively persecuted in their culture. And the people who were doing the persecuting were the wealthy, the powerful, the well-to-do. And so James says, listen now, these people treat you like garbage out in the world. And then they walk into church and you give them all this honor and deference and, oh my gosh, I can't believe the mayor's here or, you know, this celebrity walked in or whoever it is. And they're treating them so well. But when a poor person walks in, they're like, literally, just go stand in the back. You can sit down here on the floor next to me if you want to. But if somebody who's wealthy comes in, it's like, oh, please take my seat. James is like, it's crazy that you guys are acting this way. This is not how it should be for Christians and in the kingdom of God, right? Like we are so good in our world at categorizing people according to all of these kind of external characteristics. But, you know, in the end, there is really only one division that matters. There is only one dividing line between people here on earth. There are people who have acknowledged their sin and received forgiveness for it. And then there are people who insist that they do not need to be forgiven for mm -hmm. sin because they don't have any. Mm -hmm. That's the only, like those are the only judgments or distinctions that matter. It doesn't matter what your race is, age is, wealth, any citizenship. None of that matters in the end. The only thing we should be worried about is whether or not somebody has received God's grace into their lives or not. We focus on the wrong things. These guys were focused on the wrong things here in the scripture. We're focused on the wrong things often in 2021. That's why in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, verse 7, we're reminded people judge others according to their outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. He knows what's going in, yeah. going on on the inside. And so whereas we're just constantly making these snap judgments at everybody, James says we are not acting in the same way that God does, and we're not acting in the way that God wants us to. We should not fall into the trap of favoring somebody just because they have some quality or characteristic we like, and we shouldn't have prejudice against somebody because there is something about them that we dislike, right. all right? I was just thinking about this the other day, and I'm not sure that everyone who's listening does this, and, and I don't think I realized that I've been doing this for years and years and years, decades. Um, but when I first meet someone, the first compartmentalize, whatever, however to say that, I, I put them in a box, right? Okay, yeah. um, that box is Christian. Categorize them. Categorize, yeah. thank you. Uh, they're Christian or they're not Christian. And, and it occurred to me recently that not all Christians do this. Not, mm -hmm. not everyone who meets a brand new person, their first instinct is to figure out, are they Christian or not Christian? Mm -hmm. but, but for me, I've been doing that a long time. And, and in your opinion, that's actually a good thing, right? Like, like we need to figure out, like, do I need to share the gospel with them? Do I not need to share Jesus with them? And, and that is the only... Uh, category. Category. <laughs> I don't know why I can't say that word. Um, that, that is what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, so if it causes you to treat them better or worse because of where right. they fall on that line, then you're guilty of the same sin that yeah, James is talking about. Yeah, and that's not what I'm here. saying. Yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. Because, like, we all, um, you know, compartmentalize everything in our life. Okay. But, um, and, and I'm not saying that I look at someone and figure out whether or not they're Christian and then favor Christians. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I want, that's just the first thing that I figure out so that I, I can love them more. Yeah. And, and do I need to love them by sharing Jesus? Well, it's, it, it dictates how you interact with that person, right? Like what's, you know, do we have this common ground of faith? Or am I going to find opportunities to put Jesus on display for them? You know what I mean? Like what we, what we see sometimes, okay, there are Christians, like they're believers themselves, but they feel like every other Christian on the planet is like stuffy and uptight and boring. And so they're like, honestly, I don't want anything to do with Christians. I would much rather hang out with non-Christians. Okay. Like I kind of understand where you're coming from, but we've got to be careful that we don't write off an entire section of our family tree, so to speak, right, in favor of these people. And the opposite is true. There are Christians who are like, oh, I don't want anything to do with those kinds of people. I only want to be around people who wear Christian t-shirts and listen to Christian 
Christian music and watch Christian TV shows and, you know, all of those different things. And we write off that whole. So then we're actually doing the exact same yes. thing that James is talking what, about. What here. category of Christian right. are and you? And so what I'm saying is, like, in the end, the only distinction that is really going to matter is the eternal distinction, yeah. Yeah. whether or not you are with God or opposed to God. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's what really matters. So we get hung up on these smaller things and we make a big deal out of whether or not somebody's this race or that race, this gender, that gender, you know, this uh, neighborhood, that neighborhood, whatever it might be. And in the end, like none of that is half as important as this big one. So we're hung up on the wrong things. And even as James points out here, that ends up leading Christians, some Christians anyway, to honor the very people who are dishonoring them. Okay? Honoring people who are, or seeking affirmation from people who would never give affirmation to them. Like, honestly, I think some of you need to hear this. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. You are trying to honor friends who keep dishonoring you. Wow. You're trying to make them happy. And God's like, why are right. you seeking your approval and attention from them? They're not any better than anybody else. Right. Right? Okay? You're chasing affirmation from people who make you miserable. So stop favoring people who retu- refuse to return the favor. Right. Like we, we are supposed to treat people equally. We are supposed to see them ultimately the way that God sees them. That's what I think James is getting at here, that as believers, we cannot carry the perspective of the world. We have to carry the perspective of God. We have to look at people not the way the world sees them, you know, this and that and that and this, and that's good and that's bad. No, we want to see them the way that God sees them. I, I started praying that prayer. Honestly, I did um, in my 20s. I said, God, help me to see people the way that you see them. I want to see them the way that you see them. And that really changed the way that I viewed people in the world, right? Yeah. It, it means that when I see people out in, in public in Calgary, you know, whether they, you know, tick me off because they cut in front of me at the grocery line or, you know, I think, oh, that guy looks like he's a really great dad. He seems like he's really got it together and takes good care of his family, whatever it might be, right? Whether I see people who seem to be good or maybe they aren't so good, what it reminds me of is that God knows that person every bit as much as he knows me. So I have this tendency, we all do this, it's called the spotlight effect. We believe that all the eyes are on us. We're the star of the show. We're the ones who really matter. My story is the main story, okay? We have a tendency to do that. And we even start to think, like, I am really important to God's plans. I know I am. Like, I know my life matters. I'm special in some way. And yes, you are, and so is everybody else, okay? And so the thing is, you are as valuable as everybody else. They are as valuable as you. So when you see them the way that God sees them, you're like, wow, that is somebody that God loves as deeply and fully as he loves me. He loves that person so much that he gave his one and only son so that if they would believe in him, they would not perish, but they would have eternal life. The same gift that he gave to me. That helps me from like getting too proud. It helps me to remember like other people are the point. This is where I'm supposed to be focused. God, help me to see other people the way that you see them. Yeah. Help me to let go of my bias, my prejudice. Help me to honor them as your children and as your equal image bearers. It's so crazy that we're talking about this today. It was literally the prayer that I was praying this morning was, God, help me to see the beautiful soul that you created in this mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I would encourage you, we could even just stop right there. We're not going to because we got a couple more verses to cover, but we could stop right there. And if that was your takeaway for today, if you just walked away saying, okay, this this week, I'm going to pray, God, help me to see these people the way that you see them. Yeah. Strangers, co-workers, your crazy aunt on Facebook. God, help me to see them the way that you see them. I want to see people the way that you see them. If you did that, your perspective, your attitude, and your actions towards other people really would change. And I believe they would change for the better. But now here's the thing, okay? James is going to make a pivot in the next couple of verses, and he's going to extend this challenge. So, so far, the challenge is outward. God, help me to see people, those people, the way that you see them. In the next few verses, he's going to flip it around, and the challenge is going to be inward, See, if I'm praying, God, help me to see people the way that you see them, then included in that prayer is the need to see myself Mm -hmm. as you see me, Mm -hmm. God. So God, help me to see them the way that you see them, to judge them the way that you would. Help me then to see myself accurately the way that you see me, okay? So uh, verses 8 and 9, yeah. It says, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. Okay. Now, what's really interesting here, okay, in the translation we just read, it says, if you are guilty of favoring other people. That's actually not the way it's written in the Greek. In the Greek, it literally says, since you are favoring other mm. people. So he's talking to Christians who are actually committing this, okay? And he's saying, look, you, you, you talk the good talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, because that's what Jesus taught us to do. And yet, if you favor certain people, or if you have prejudice against certain groups, then you are actually committing a sin. You are breaking this law, okay? If you want to see yourself the way that God sees you, okay, everything we've said so far applies to you, okay? You are God's beloved child. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. No matter what your life is like, God loves you as one of his own children. And you are a sinner. <laughs> yep. And so am I. Yep. And so is everyone. Now, I understand that's not a very politically correct thing to say in our world, right? When I talk to people about God, then they're all on board with the idea of like God being this loving father and we're his child and he, you know, totally embraces us and loves us and things. But the moment you bring up sin, people bristle, they get mad, you know, and they want to argue a little bit. And oftentimes they'll say something like, well, you know, I mean, okay, I, I'm not perfect, sure. And I guess I've broken, if God has rules, I've probably broken a couple of them. But they'll often say something along the lines of like, you know, I bet, I, I, I bet I'm a good person, really, when you get right down to it. Like, I, I try to do the right thing more often than not. My goal is to leave the world a better place than I found it. When I go hiking, I pack it in, I pack it out, you know, all that good stuff. I don't litter. I try. And so if you were to like put all my good deeds on one side of a scale and all my bad deeds on another, I'm just confident that I would have more good deeds right. than I would bad deeds, okay? So they're making an argument about their sin based on quantity, right. all right? James anticipates this argument a little bit. Look at what he says here in uh, verse number 10. It says, for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. Mm. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. Okay, so you jumped a little far ahead. That's all right. No big deal. Um, in verse number 10, Okay, he says here that if you've broken one law, you're as guilty as somebody who's broken all the laws. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you say, well, I mean, I've done more good than I have bad, and that's the wrong question to ask. See, sin is not determined by its quantity. Right. It's not about like, have you done more good than bad? Or have you committed X number of sins and suddenly that puts you over the limit? That's not the question. We, we shouldn't even be asking like, how many sins have I committed? Have I done more good? That's not even the right question. If you have committed a single sin, then you are a sinner. Mm -hmm. If you've lied once, well, that makes you a liar, right? If you stole from a, a grocery store when you were 11 years old, guess what? That means you're a thief. I may not be a thief today, but like that's true of me, right? And so, you know, there is this sense in James's letter here that we commit these sins and we, we, we say, we minimize it essentially is what we do. We're like, this is not really that big of a deal. And I don't see what the problem is. And even if it is a sin, you know, it's not a big one. And I don't do it that often. James is saying here, look, it's not about the quantity. It doesn't matter how many you've committed. If you have committed a single sin, then you've committed one too many, and you're in trouble, and this needs to be dealt with, right? And then other people will say like, okay, well, maybe I've committed a lot of little sins, but I'm not doing the big ones, you know? I've never murdered anybody. I've never robbed anybody. I've never like committed those big sins. This not even called, stuff like on the Ten Commandments or this whatever. This is called justification. It is, right? And so you read the verse there. I, I want you to read it again, okay? The, the verse, uh, verse number 11, I believe, talks about murder and adultery. And look at what James says here. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. And you know yeah. what I find is really interesting? We could talk about sin for a whole series, right. totally. But um, what I find really interesting is that you know, we, we justify, like it's the small thing, like when you're a kid and you steal a pack of gum and then if you don't get caught, it becomes the next big thing, mm -hmm. like almost like this high sure. that you're seeking. Yeah. And sin can be this 
uh, drug mm -hmm. that you're le leeching off of. And, and and guys, this is even how like people in the ministry can, you, you, you hear of pastors getting arrested and you're like, how could that even happen? He was like serving God with his whole life. Like how would that even happen? I'm telling you, like it's a justification process where mm -hmm. you're just like this little thing crept into my mind and then whatever crept into my mind eventually became a thing that was on the outside, mm -hmm. but I still hid it from the world. And that's the importance of like sharing what what we're wrestling with this is the importance of community yeah, you guys yeah. so important that we're wrestling through these things together the importance of, of connect groups and like being together and like really fleshing out like here's my struggles can you pray with me like this is what i'm because if you're just justifying if you're like i'm not a sinner and you're defensive like no i'm fine i'm perfect then then you're just justifying your own sin because we all have right, sin right. and so as soon as you start justifying that one thing then what's the next bigger thing and then you're justifying that thing and it turns into an even bigger thing mm -hmm. and that's how people end up on the news because <laughs> you know whatever sure so james is saying here okay sin is not a matter of quantity and in verse 11 he says it's not a matter of quality it doesn't matter whether your sin is murder or adultery. Obviously, murder is worse than adultery. Adultery is bad. Or if your sin is prejudice. Mm -hmm. See, this is the argument mm -hmm. he's making here. Okay? You think this is such a tiny thing, but in the end, it doesn't matter. You break one of the laws, you might as well have broken all of them. You, you transgress a single one of God's commands, then suddenly there is a debt, there is an imbalance, both in our world and in your soul, that needs to be addressed. He's not saying that all sin is the same, but he's saying that all sin leads to the same place. Right. See, all sin leads to separation or broken fellowship from God. So what should we do, right? Like James's message here is like really disappointing. Yeah. It's very discouraging, yeah. okay? On the one hand, we're all beloved sons and daughters of God. And on the other hand, we're all rebellious children who've run away from our home. And uh, in the process, we've nearly destroyed ourselves and one another, even with our petty little sins like prejudice, right? That's why I love okay. it. It's just well, a slap in the face. That's right. So you should see this actually as good news, yeah. as a good word and not a harsh word, okay? I believe James is actually doing something intentional. I think he's trying to break us down so he can build a up. I really do. I think he's trying to break us down yes. so he can build us up. See, in the end, we cannot address what we will not acknowledge. If we will not address the, or acknowledge rather the sin in our heart, yeah. then we can never let the Holy Spirit address it because right. I don't have any sin. I'm not prejudiced. I don't look at people that way. I don't commit adultery. I've never slept with my wife. Yeah, but you're pulling up the, the private browser tab, right? Like James is saying here, you have got to acknowledge the sin that's actually going on in your heart. I've never killed anybody. That's right. But you've wanted to murder them in your heart. All of these things, if we pretend we have no sin, James says, we are liars and the truth is not in us. And so what we have to do here is allow these words to break down the wall of righteousness that we've built up, like self-righteousness that we've built up. The comfy little life where we put on the mask and we look the part and we pretend we don't do anything wrong. We're better than those people. That's another form of prejudice. We have to break all of that down so that something better can come in its place. We've seen that here in our building, haven't we? When we first walked into this place a couple of months ago, like it was gorgeous. It was really fantastic, but it wasn't built out the way that we needed to. So then we hired some contractors and they came in with hammers and saws and they started tearing up concrete, pulling out wires, and the place was ugly for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. However, they're all following the plan of a master architect. Yeah. The architect knows where this thing is going. It knows where it was. It knows where it needs to go. And the architect understands the process to get there. Okay? The same thing is true of us. We're over here. God knows we need to get over here. We need to just get in line with the plan of the architect who's working behind the scenes. But in order for that to happen, there's got to be some tearing down. There has to be some acknowledgement of the sin that exists inside of all of us. I am not perfect. I have sin, lots of sin in my life and heart. You have lots of sin in your life and heart. You have lots of sin in your life and heart. And you might say it's petty, it's small, it's not really that big of a deal. You might say, oh, it's not all that much. But the point James is actually going to make in a later chapter is that sin always leads to death. It always leads to destruction. So it's better to deal with it now. It's better to live out the gospel every single day. This is the point that James is making here, that in the end, we need to look at people the way that God looks at them. Yeah. That means we need to see people on the street the way that God sees them, and we need to see ourselves the way that God so sees good. us. We are his children, but we have sinned. That means we're rebellious and we've run away from home. Now, the only way that we're going to come back into the family is the same way that like a rebellious or wayward child would come back in the family. They would come through the front door and they would say, mom, dad, 
I screwed up. I've made mistakes. I'm sorry. I want to change. I want things to be different. If you said that to your heavenly father, he would give it to you. He would give you a fresh start and welcome you into his family, just like any good earthly parent. This is the challenge that James gives us, that we don't think like the world about them or ourselves, but instead we have the perspective of God and that we see ourselves and everybody else the way that he does. So good. If you've made a decision to start or restart a relationship with Jesus, we'd love to hear about it. Today is the beginning of your faith journey, and like any journey, it begins with just one small step. That first step is to tell someone about your decision to do life with Jesus. You are never meant to do life or faith alone, so don't. Let us partner with you in your faith journey. Our team would love the opportunity to pray for you, answer any questions you may have, and if you don't already have one, we have a free Bible for you. Let us know about your faith decision, ask for prayer or request a Bible by typing faith in the comments below or by texting the word faith to 587-600-2055. Over the past couple months with renovations of our new building starting and stopping or the COVID restrictions decreasing or increasing, God has given us a valuable lesson in patience and faith. Honestly, there were times when finishing this project, raising enough money, and relaunching in this building felt nearly impossible. But instead, what the past couple months have actually affirmed for us is that God is faithful, and with Him, nothing is impossible. When we needed it the most, God provided. And we pre- when we presented the financial obstacles ahead of us, you all were incredibly generous, more than we ever expected. And to those that have already given, thank you so much for your faithfulness in this season. But now that those hurdles appear to be behind us, can I ask you to do one more thing? Remain faithful, continue to give. There are three things that you can contribute to God's kingdom, your time, your talent, and your treasure. And I realize that I've now asked for all three of those from you this morning, but I can't do this alone. We can't do this alone. Together, we are the church, and our mission doesn't stop here. Getting a new building is amazing and enables us to do so much more, but it's not the end goal. It's a step along the path, and we will not be finished until every person in Calgary knows the name of Jesus and what it means to live life overflowing. So if you can serve even one Sunday a month, join the dream team. And if you can give even a small amount, go to connectcalgary.ca slash give. Renovations here are almost finished, but we are just getting started. Thank you for joining us this morning. I can't wait to be with you all again in person. Until then, have a great week and live life overflowing.